What's up, guys? Welcome to 88.1 WLRA with the Step Back with Kyle and Pat. How's it going, Pat? It's going good, Kyle. How's it going, bro? Pretty good. We got some uh, games to get into from yesterday. We got yeah. some college basketball to talk about. Yeah. Um, I know you said you wanted to start with um, with the NBA, so that's, uh, let's get into it. But I was, I was just talking to you about this before the show about James Harden and how Nick Wright made a really, really good take on his show this morning with Chris Carter. Um, great show, by the way. I'm a big Nick, Nick Wright guy. Uh, I don't know about you, but big, big Nick Wright guy. He's a, I think he's a good analyst, but his love of LeBron clouds his judgment sometimes. But I agree. Outside of his LeBron takes, he's I a good basketball analyst. I agree. Analyst. He yeah. has a good basketball mind. Definitely. Compared to, like, Skip Bayless and yeah, for all sure. those. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, anyways, um, he said that there are, there's only 10 players in NBA history who have averaged 35 points a game. He said, like, five of them are Wilt Chamberlain, which are unbelievable. But, um James Harden is the only player, or is, out of all 10 players that have averaged 35 points a game, James Harden has the highest true shooting percentage. And I know that we're, we talk about, and you, were, you made a good point saying free throws cloud that a Yeah, because bit. true shooting percentage, free throws do affect true shooting percentage. So if you go there and shoot 21 free throws a game and you, make, and you go true, 21 for 21, yeah. your true shooting percentage goes through the roof. Exactly. And so, Harden gets so many chintzy fouls and... and Spent so much time at the line, but go ahead, right. keep going. Okay, so I think is this year different regarding what? As far as James Harden, is this year different? I'm, I mean, this year has just been absurd. James Harden is is the right now, in my opinion, he's the best player in the league. Right as of right now, this point in time in the league this season, currently right now, James Harden is the best player in the league. Yeah, but it's not the first time he's done. I mean, maybe it's the first time he's taken it to this extent. But I mean, he's a he won the MVP. He probably should be working on his third MVP right now. If we're being honest, yeah, it's a okay. regular season award. Like he's done this before. Well, what's going to happen is he's, in my opinion, he's going to get into the playoffs. He's going to fizzle out again. He's going to have another fourteen point elimination game performance. Dude, he got locked up by Manu Ginobili. He scored 10 points in an yeah, elimination. But that, a 40-year-old Manu. I, I agree. I agree with that. And that, that was, what, years ago? No, it was two Yeah, it was two years ago. Okay, so that's two years ago. So I don't. there's no way Harden can change this whole narrative that he just doesn't do well in the playoffs because they took Golden State to seven last year. Yeah, and I think the narrative – I mean, yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. They missed all those three-pointers. and. What if that was fluky? Well, I think the narrative about Harden not being able to play well in the playoffs, it sort of exists for a reason. And sort of like I was just saying about spending so much time at the free throw line, he lives and dies by those foul calls a lot of times. I time. agree. Of course, he's super skilled, and he can get to the hoop, and he can finish with both hands, and he can his step back three is unguardable at some points. Yeah. But a lot of his... A lot of his success comes from the foul line. And in the playoffs, he's not getting those calls. He's getting those calls in the regular season, and he's not getting those calls in the playoffs. Because they're not going to call that. They're going to let those chintzy little ones where somebody grazes his beard, they're going to let that go. Yeah. So he's not getting those calls in the playoffs. So I think that that – so it's like I know what you mean, but I think that that narrative sort of exists for a reason. I think it's sort of inherent based on the way he plays the game. I can agree with that. But I think – I mean, we were watching the game last night, and yeah, it was pretty incredible. Yeah, and if you guys didn't catch the game, uh, Miami was in Houston last night, and it was kind of one of those D Wade farewell tours. And this was the game after D Wade hit the game winner, banking it against Golden State. Um, but just J Miami had what a ten point lead? I think it was twenty. They had a twenty point lead, and yeah, they or twenty one. They, they had a twenty one point, point lead. Yeah. Harden goes for like fifty eight, ten and eight. You know, and I, I just, I don't know. I feel, I think Harden is going down the same road that Westbrook is, where he's changing his game. He's becoming more efficient um, just as of the second half of the season. Or am I wrong? I don't know. I think that he's always played like this, or at least for the last three, four seasons. 
I don't think we're seeing anything out of James Harden that we haven't seen before, minus the fact, minus maybe a little bit of the numbers. But I said it before, I'll say it again. Mike D'Antoni, dude. How good is James Harden on the, I don't know, pick another team that's decent. How good is he on that team? It's because of Mike D'Antoni. A lot of it is because of the D'Antoni's offense. Dude, he shot 32 times yesterday. Yeah, okay. He, he shot 18 fi- threes. Yeah, 15 at 32, that's bad. 16 to 32, it's 50%. 16, yeah. It's 50%, it's pretty good. It's 32 shots, though. Yeah. It's D'Antoni's system is... Okay, but I don't think we can take that much away from Harden. No, I think no, that's absolutely a stretch. not. You're absolutely not. But I'm just saying, it's like, I love the way Bruce Hard puts it. For certain ball handlers who can score, D'Antoni's system is PEDs. It will inflate everything out of their numbers. It will completely... The Jeremy Lin stuff, the Chris Duhon stuff... Okay, the let's Ray put, Felton stuff. Ray Felton yeah. averaged like eighteen and nine. Under no, the you're right. Time. You're right. We've talked about this before many times. So you take a guy who's like a t- thirty points a game guy, and you put him in D'Antoni, and he's capable of averaging thirty seven and a half or whatever Harden's. Okay, let right me now. let me run this by you then. You drop, put James Harden on Orlando. There you go. That that's my point. How how, how good is he? Twenty five. Uh, no, more than that. Probably probably thirty two, thirty points a game, something like that. Without D'Antoni. Probably. He's super skilled. No one's taking that away from him. Yeah, okay. 30 points a game, though? Maybe. I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, I don't know. I would say, like, 27 is my ballpark. D'Antoni's, like, the most laid back. Remember when James Harden was in that stretch, and D'Antoni was, like, they were, like, asking him about it, and he's like, I'm not going to say anything to him. I'm just going to let him keep doing it. What am I going to do? Coach him to mediocrity? Yeah. Like, he's way, he knows way more <laughs> than I do. Yeah. He's better than I will, ever was. Like, yeah. I'm just going to let him do his thing. Right. Like, where, when you have coaches like that who are just like, no, go shoot it 35 times. I don't care. Well, here's like, my take then. D'Antoni's system is hindering Chris Paul. 100%. Well, okay. Chris Paul, since he come back from injury, he just... He's been playing like just another guy in the Harden style. I, I agree. He's not. They have not he's split not, it equally, and Chris Paul is not doing what he could be doing. He's not a superstar anymore. Totally, in my totally. in my eyes, I mean, he probably could be. Oh, absolutely. He's only what 33, 34? But he's playing next to Harden, and Harden just always has the ball in his hands, and he just dribbles. Yeah, the shot clock down, yeah, and, and he ISOs, yeah, and never passes yeah, the totally, ball. Totally, unless they're like oops to Capella. You know, it's yeah. it's. So, what do what do you think? Let, let me change this conversation. Now. So, what are your thoughts on Chris Paul? Well, it's a good question. It's a good question. I think he just signed that huge deal. It's five yeah, it's just years. a massive deal to be yeah. just another guy on the team. I don't know, man. The it's, last year of his deal is gonna be like thirty nine or thirty eight, and he can't even stay healthy now. If you're the Rockets, I'd probably Move wish him. probably wish I didn't have that contract and go out and sign Clay. <sighs> Yeah, but then you got to run Harden at the true point, which is how he always tires out. Like, here, here's what I think. Come playoff time, they need Chris Paul. I agree. If Chris Paul was in that game seven last year against Golden State, they would have won that game. They they missed, what did they miss, 27 threes in a row or something like that? Dude, if that happens and Chris Paul's in the game, he's not allowing that to happen. He's slowing the game down. He's running a pure point guard. He's running high screen and roll, he's getting somebody an easy look, he's getting somebody an easy basket. You know how it is when you're when you're struggling to score and then you start feeling like, "Oh my god, I can't score. I can't we can't score. We need to score." And then people are jacking up bad shots. Bad. It's like that's when you need the skill set of Chris Paul, who's like a true point guard who can slow everything down and find easy buckets for people. Well, time get out. Capella at the rim. I have I have a, I have another thing for you then because Chris Paul is the same narrative James Harden does. He can't win in the, in the playoffs. playoffs. Yeah. Can't do anything. Yep. So, I mean, what's your point? Can you really bank on If we're going by this narrative that James Harden can't win in the playoffs, what about Chris Paul? I mean, yeah, but to your original point, they could have won last year. They could have beat Golden State. Absolutely. And I think I still stand by the fact that if they had Chris Paul, they probably would have. Yeah. I, that's, that's interesting. The Rockets are a very interesting yeah, team. Yeah, you're right. I mean, they're a little bit of a different team this year, obviously, with no they Reza totally and no Luka new guys. Mute, yeah. I, you know what? I don't think Houston's going to do anything this year. Me neither. I don't think. Uh, they don't have the bodies. They're like not Harden taking, and Chris Paul are doing everything. They're not taking Golden State to seven, even if Boogie wasn't there. Run that same series back, but minus Ariza and Luka Mbamute. 
The Rockets have. They're the not same taking squad. them to seven again. The Rockets have the same squad, and the Warriors don't have Boogie. I yeah, think the yeah, Warriors that's what I'm beat them in seven, or beat them at less least. Than seven. At least yeah. I think that last year was their chance. Yeah, I agree. That was their shot. I don't know, man. I mean, what we'll, what we'll to find out? But it depends. It also depends how the seeding works out. You know what I mean? Seeding is everything in the West. Totally. Right? Yeah. Like Denver now is the number one seed. And if the Lakers sneak into the eight seed, we've been saying all year that if LeBron somehow can find Denver and, and avoid Golden State in the first round, they're going to move on. I'm taking on. LeBron. Yeah, in that absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Um, all right. Speaking of Golden State, they lost to Orlando yesterday. 103 to 96. Yeah, KD think, didn't play, but remember, that's a championship with team Boogie. without KD. And, with and they added Boogie, right? Yeah. That's a championship team without KD, and they have Boogie, and they lost to Orlando. Um, Curry and Thompson both kind of played. Bad. I think that that was more of a hangover, maybe from that the Miami D-Wade game. Wade game. And then you have to go play Orlando, who kind of it really isn't that good, but they're okay. They're good enough to be like a seven or eight seed, maybe. Probably not. They're like the eight seed in the playoffs right now. Yeah, that's bad. Yeah, that's really bad. That looks bad on the Steph east. Steph Curry, twelve of thirty three and five of seventeen from deep. So we were talking. Clay Thompson, nine of twenty three and three of twelve from deep. Awful. Terrible, dude. So we were talking about the Hawks last night, right? Do you see this new report coming out? Which one? Hawks are targeting superstar free agents in this offseason. Go on. Go get Atlanta, Clay. Right? Go get Clay. Why would Clay ever come Trey to Young Atlanta? Trey Young and Clay. He would never come to Atlanta. What if you throw insane money at Clay? You can only throw a yeah, certain, certain amount, <laughs> amount, of, amount of money. But still. Whatever I mean, you throw, Golden State can throw more because they have the fifth year. And why would he not go play for the Lakers? If he wasn't going to leave, go play for the Lakers. Go play with LeBron. Go play where I your dad Clay- was a superstar, where your dad still works for the organization. That would never happen. I agree. I, I don't think there's and I mean there's no way he's gonna pass up Steph and, and KD and LeBron to go play with Trey Young. Yeah, come but, on. Yeah, no, I agree. But I think Clay is an unbelievable fit in that system. I mean, in the if it was a video game, yeah, Trey Young and Clay are yeah. just unstoppable. But there's people's opinions in, in his yeah, his own feelings and, yeah, come into it. Yeah, he's concerned. like, I'm not doing yeah, that. I'm going to Atlanta. Yeah. I agree. But I, I think that would be that would be awesome. I think Atlanta should just Go get him. It would never happen, but you got to you gotta do something. What if they get who, – who can Atlanta acquire this year? Chris Middleton? You think he's going to leave? It's a lot of money. It's a lot of you money, think Chris he Middleton. get maxed by – Milwaukee? Yeah. Absolutely. He's he an all-star. I wouldn't do it. You wouldn't? I wouldn't max Chris Middleton. What if they, what if they go to, t- to the finals this year? What Still, if they lose in like six Middleton's or Middleton's got to go crazy. Like he's got to go stupid. Who on Golden State can stop Giannis from getting to the rack? KD, Iggy, not going to happen. Draymond? Never. No. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. Um, That's very interesting, though, because what if Milwaukee passes up on Middleton and they go get someone in really good? What if – here's a, here's a – out of left field. What if Clay signs with Milwaukee? That's, like, what, that's what, what we Giannis. were saying. We've been talking Giannis. about yeah. that. Because Giannis can sort of do the same thing that LeBron does. Not really. Don't get it twisted. But, I mean, like, what in they, that, he can create. They're the number one defensive team in the league. They're the number one three-point shooting team in the league right now. They gen, Giannis generates more three-pointers. Dude, they have so many guys who reign. Miritich, Brooke Lopez, Brogdon, Ilyasova. They got all these dudes who just reign threes. What if Clay was just like, dude, let me go there and get some open shots. They're the number one seed. Mm. What if What if Milwaukee throws them, like, a... Two year, one one year op out, like a player option. I still don't think he's leaving to go anywhere but like a max on two years. <sighs> Sheesh! But then he's got to play hard for the next two years and do good to prove his worth. Yeah, he can get a no, max I don't again. think that. I think it's, I think <laughs> he's his, guaranteed a big max. Yeah, anyway. I don't think his I don't think his legacy is going to drop at all. I really don't. I think if anybody sees Clay Thompson anywhere, they're going to throw him any type of money for a very long time. Am I wrong? No, nah, you're probably right. But as long as he keeps. The production up. Can't be shooting three to twelve all the time like he did yesterday. Clay would fit anywhere in today's NBA. True, yeah. true. He's six seven two guard. He's, He's an un- unre- un- unbelievable perimeter defender. Just range from everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. He beat Steph Curry in a three point shootout once. Clay's like a top ten player in the league. Dude, Clay might be. Uh, if Curry didn't exist, Clay might be the greatest shooter ever. Oh he, yeah, I have Curry and Clay. 
If Curry never existed on this planet, Clay Thompson would be the greatest shooter of all time. Which is hilarious because by they a just wide happen, margin, they just happen to exist at the same time on the same team. It's absurd. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Like what? Yeah, that's so unfair. Oh my gosh! All right, let's talk about this um, Philly OKC game that we were watching last night. Well, no PG. I'm not impressed with Philadelphia. Not at all. They should have won that game hands down. They and didn't they, have JoJo though. Right down to the end. Yeah, but they still have four All Star caliber players out there. They're running out Ben Simmons, Tobias Harris, uh, Jimmy Butler, JJ. JJ. They're running out like a stacked squad, dude. Here's what I noticed. Right down to the end, right down to the bitter end, they were making mistakes. With three seconds left, Ben Simmons throws the ball away. After OKC claws back into the game, they're still making mistakes right down into the end. If you remember last year in the playoffs, that's what people were saying. They were like, oh, this team needs like a superstar to show them how to win at the end of games and how to close out games. Like they did get Tobias, they did get Jimmy. So like they they heard the criticism and they try to address it, but it's like, man, still right down to the end of the games, they're doing everything they possibly can to blow these games. And we got another retro Westbrook performance. Yep. Eight of twenty four, six of nine from the line, one of nine from three and four turnovers. Well I don't really yeah, that's true. But I don't really blame him that much because no PG when you're missing your M V P caliber yeah. teammate Russell's got to try and do something out yeah. there okay. and a lot of that came late in the game when he was trying to get them back into it because they were clawing back into that game they only lost by four they had a chance to win it at the Philly end was almost it? up 20 at one point yeah I <laughs> yeah I don't know man I it's it's very interesting and I think I, I also want to talk here I want to I want to shift gears real quick okay I want to talk about Indiana Bohan Bogdanovich 37 and 7 last night. And Pacers right now are 41 and 22 without Oladipo. Dude, remember when he went down? You were like, it's over. I'm like, yeah. that's not what any. I, I would have thought that too. But if you look at like the all the projections and the analytics, like they were saying they're a 99.2% chance to make it with Ola and a 99.2% chance to stay, stay the same. It's like, how? They are solid. They had a Wesley Matthews. Miles Turner is nice. That Young is nice. Doug McDermott can hit open shots. Corey Joseph can hit open shots. Darren Collison can hit open shots. Kylo Quinn is a nice body off the bench. Indiana is nice. They're not going to go anywhere in the playoffs. Maybe, But they're there. You're going to have to deal series. with them. They'll yeah, you got to deal with them. Dude, I've been seeing more and more Thad Young defensive player of the year takes. How about, how what about What is up with that? How about the fact Thad that Thad Young? Yeah, I know. Sabonis has been hurt for months. Tyreek Evans is hurt. They That's two more solid bodies that Indiana can bring off the bench that I don't want to see in the playoffs. I don't want to see Sabonis, Tyreek Evans. Yeah, I don't Evans. want to deal with them in the first round. No, no way. No, no, that's true. And they're upset because they always get handled by LeBron. So they're like, we got to prove it this year. He's gone. They're a three seed. Yeah, they're a home court. They're solid. They're a home. They're ahead of Boston. They're <laughs> yeah. solid. Yeah. Oh, speaking of Boston, dude, let's get into Boston. Yeah, they okay. they blew it the other night. Boston is in their last six games with Kyrie. They're zero and six in their last six games without him. They're six and zero. I think their defensive rating is like one hundred and twenty eight without him, and like one hundred and eighteen with him. Their offensive everything is up without him. Assist per game, points per game, every single thing is up. Their offensive rating as a whole is up. Everything is up without him. And did you see him crying on the bench, yelling at guys? It's like, dude, he is turning into what he hated in LeBron. Well, we, we always talk about how good of an executive Danny Ainge is. Like, one of the best of he all. He should have moved Kyrie at the sp- deadline, right, dude. Right, right, got some Got some value for him because well, his best no. asset's going to leave. He's going to walk for nothing. You're going right. to get nothing. Well, I, I don't think in any right state of mind you could ever do that. That would turn Why? the basketball world upside down. If you deal Kyrie for AD straight up at the deadline, you're in a playoff race. No, not even AD, but something. You got Because AD's not very valuable either because he's going to walk too. You got to get some sort of value. Well, you, I think Danny Ainge is banking on the fact that Kyrie at the beginning of the year said, I'll, I'll come back if you guys have me back. Yeah, but that slowly started to shift since then. And even by the deadline... He was not. Remember, he was like, "Ask me again on July 1st. I don't want to talk about it." That was before the deadline. He yeah. said that. Well, I think we need to. I think Danny Ainge is going to be fine. He's going to figure it out. He has a bunch of young pieces, and even without Kyrie, they're very good. I mean, you just said without six, Kyrie, they're better. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, they're six and zero without Kyrie, without a superstar. That's such a wild thing because it's like 
Well, I think it also has to do with Brad Stevens, dude. Brad Stevens is a butler. He's the coach of Butler. He never had five star recruits. He had to take like decent players and make them overachieve. Whereas now he's got a bunch of decent NBA players, your Jalen Browns and your Marcus Smarts and stuff. And they play great. But then when he's got this five-star caliber player, they don't play as well with him. That's not his style of coaching. His style of coaching is drawing up awesome, confusing, out-of-bounds plays. Remember that one Avery Bradley knocked down against LeBron in the playoffs to win yeah. that game? It's like, dude, that, Brad Stevens' this whole thing is making average guys play way above average. Well, it's player when he progression. Has a, yeah, exactly. Yeah. When he has a great superstar player, he's not used to He doesn't know how to deal with that. He could turn IT, who's a career six man, into an MVP caliber guy. But I'm not sure he could turn an MVP caliber guy into that next step. Well, I've been saying this for a long time about Brad Stevens' offense. It's very point guard heavy. A lot like D'Antoni. Not as dramatic as D'Antoni, but it's very point guard friendly. Yeah, but even without him... Last year, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, these guys' numbers are who way is, up. Who is their, their number one guy, though? Their minutes are up. Their shots are up. No, I'm talking about in the playoffs without Kyrie. Yeah, but remember this whole Scary Terry thing? Yeah, but he wasn't their number one guy. Uh, Jason Tatum has 22 points a game last year without Kyrie. Now he's down to 16. Yeah, I think uh, my whole is thing all is— All their minutes are down and stuff, too. Yeah, Kyrie's got to go. Yeah, what's up with the player progression, dude? We need Jay- we're going to need Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum. We need these guys in the future. We need to keep building them. Terry Rozier, all these other guys. Dude, Terry Rozier's on a $3 million deal. I should have sent Kyrie and got somebody else. Terry Rozier will probably stay, dude. He should. You could probably you could probably toss him like $7 million. You could probably toss him a mid-level exception. Non-tax, non-taxpayer MLE, Terry Rozier, what's up? Come join the Celtics for life. He probably would have. He would probably stay. You don't need a superstar taking up minutes and taking up shots and taking up all this stuff when your whole, when your whole style, your whole brand is team friendly. Yeah, and then we're going. In, they're going in a timeout, and Kyrie's yelling at these guys on the bench. That's these guys I'm don't want to hear that. That's yeah, what I'm I agree. saying. I agree. Dude. Yeah, Kyrie. I think. Well, my whole point at the beginning of this conversation was we all know Danny Ainge is one of the best executives in the history of professional sports, but I think you you don't think Danny Ainge doesn't know this, right? Yeah, of course he does. I, I don't know. It's almost like he's banking on they're going to win it this year. That's why he kept Kyrie. But it's like, dude, no one's going to win it while Golden State's trotting out six Hall of Famers. You know what I mean? They have a Finals MVP coming off the bench. Iggy was a former All-Star. Like, dude, you have six guys who are pr- likely Hall of Famers on your team. You're starting five Hall of Famers. I think that this year has been a throwaway for every team. So what is the point of not trying to play for the future? If that's the case and you think Kyrie might go to New York or whatever – just move him at the deadline. Get some value back. What if he would have got like two? What if what if Danny Ainge could have moved Kyrie and got like two Jalen Brown level guys? Or yeah, a bunch more picks. J- Danny Ainge has four first round picks this year. Yeah, well, with protections, we'll see. But yeah, I agree. With protections, we'll see. But um, I don't know. I think he'll pro- he has two unprotected, I believe, including his own and another one. But um, it's like Memphis or something, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. No, I think that one's protected. Okay. But yeah, they, they have, have somebody else's. They, pick. Have, the they have four total. They have oh, the they have Sacramento's yeah. pick. Yeah, that's right. So um, I don't know. We'll see. Um, I'm interested to see what the Celtics are going to do. I'm very interested to see what Tatum's progression is going to be without Kyrie, because with with Kyrie, Tatum is so overrated. Yeah, he's just a guy. He's so overrated. But without Kyrie, I'd love to see. This yeah. Jason Tatum progress into yeah. what he could be. Same with Jalen Brown, dude. Yeah. You know? It's like, dude, their minutes are so down. Their shots are so down. It's hard to get these guys to – remember that Remember that game when Kuzma could have had like 50 in the third quarter, but they yeah. sat him? Dude, he shot the ball 30-something times. When's the last time he gave Jason Tatum that opportunity? Never. Because yeah. he can't because Kyrie's out here dribbling the air out of the ball. I agree. Which is fine. It's like – it's sort of like we were saying about Westbrook before the season started. It's like, yeah – it's it's a weird problem to have because it's like Kyrie is clearly your best player, obviously, uh, quite obviously. Yeah. But the answer for your team might be less Kyrie, which yeah. is weird. You know what I mean? Like your team has better success when Kyrie's not out there dribbling the air out of the ball. You know what I'm saying? The ball moves more. Everyone gets more shots. It's weird. It's a tough situation. It's very weird. All right, let's get into this Utah Denver game last night. Okay. 
That was an awesome game. Yeah, big win for Denver or for Utah on the road in Denver. That's a big win without Rubio too. That's a huge. Donovan win. Mitchell running the point. I th- I think the most underrated big man in the league is Rudy Gobert. Underrated, he's defensively, he's the reigning defensive yeah, player of the year. Yeah, but he's so slept on. Yeah, that's fair, but I mean, he just won Defensive Player of the Year he's last so year. He's so good. Rudy Gobert is so he's, good. He's awesome. He's unbelievable. But dude, they almost blew that lead. Denver did such a good job of cutting into that lead, and they did it with Jokic on the bench when he was in foul trouble. Remember, yeah. he was screaming, and, and Mike Malone was bagging him. Well, to we were, he's like, shut up. Yeah. Shut up. He had five fouls. He was yeah. about to get teed up. So they sat Jokic, and they sliced that lead down to nothing. Well, this is what Reggie said last night while we were watching the game. He goes, dude, they're 11 deep. Yeah. You could throw Malik Beasley, Isaiah, you could throw Will Barton, you could throw uh Tory Craig is nice off the bench. You can uh you could throw who else do they have? I mean they just have bodies. Have, Mason Plumley is mm-hmm. nice off the bench. Yep. They just Monte have Morris. Bo- Monty Morris is yeah, nice. Yeah. The, and mean, they guess what? They still don't have Michael Porter. Yeah. Absurd. Yeah. Them not They're gonna add him. Is he gonna play this year? What no. about in the playoffs? No? No. He's gonna be out. They're gonna sit him as long as they have to. Yeah. Like Embiid and yeah. Simmons. Whatever, dude. Look how those two are doing. Yeah, dude, that's a nice team. Their whole team is nice. Jokic only play- Jokic goes 5 for 15 yesterday, but he still had 13 boards and 7 dimes. But they cut that lead with him on the bench. Like you are saying. Dude, here's another thing. We need to talk. I've always like half-jokingly said this, but Joe Ingles is awesome. Yeah. Yesterday, Joe Ingles had... 15 points on 4 of 12 shooting. He did not shoot that well, but he had 4 boards and 10 assists. Yeah. Remember he was out there like laughing. He's having a good time. He's joking around. He's talking trash to Kevin Harlan on the sideline. Like, the whole time, he's like, dude, he's an awesome guy to have on your team. Yeah, because he's just a fun-loving guy. He's there to win. He wants to have he fun. He makes winning plays. Yeah. He's like, he's yeah. not out there for his own stats. He's there to make winning plays. Same argument I make about Marcus Smart. Like, people don't like him because they look at the box where they say, ah, he shot, what is it, four for 12. But it's like, yeah, but if you watch the game, you know how many play, you know how many points they scored because he did something? He got the hockey assist or he got dirty for a loose ball or something like that. Like that doesn't show up in the box score. He's out there to win games. He had 10 dimes yesterday with no Rubio and Donovan Mitchell running the point. If you remember when Rubio was out last year and they tried to have Donovan Mitchell run the point, it's what ruined everything. They probably could have stayed alive even longer, but they, they couldn't because Donovan Mitchell didn't know how to run the point. He didn't, he either knows how to, or now he's doing much better. But back then it's like he either knew how to just get buckets or he wasn't sure like what to do. He yeah. he'd overthink and he whereas now he can sort of slow it down and make the right basketball play. Well, I want to get back into the Nuggets because I like that bench lineup that they put in with IT Will Barton, Mason Plumley. You could throw Monty Morris. Will in Barton there. had was their leading scorer yeah. and their leading. Will ass- Barton is nice. He had thirteen boards too. He was yeah. their leading rebounder. Yeah, Will Barton twenty one nice. and thirteen. He can knock down threes too. Will Barton had a big floater at the end of the game. Will Barton is nice. He's a nice body to have. He just go, goes in and just gets buckets. Yeah, dude. I agree. He's six six. He's like a big, yeah, big body. He's he can awesome. play D. Yeah, I like I like Will Barton too. Yeah. He's a good player. Yeah. Denver is legit. Yeah, I agree. But still, come see LeBron in the playoffs in the first round. I don't know. You really? You want to bet on that? You and I should make a bet on that series. If I, it happens. See, time out. If it because happens, we got to make a bet on that series on the air. Because I made this take first. I was the one who came on air and was like, dude, LeBron could beat Denver in the playoffs. But now that I'm thinking about it, Denver's so deep. And wh- what are you going to throw off the bench? Mike Muscala? Are you throw Lance? Dude, how about. The fact that Mike Muscala played four minutes the other day for the Lakers. Yeah, you traded Zubac, who comes in and just is a double double machine. And you you trade him for a guy who's going to play four minutes. Why are you why are you moving Zubac for Zubac a guy who's not going to play? He's starting for the Clippers right yeah, now. Yeah, he's awesome. He's like twenty. Yeah, I don't know what they're doing. That man. was that was bad because yeah. they wanted to surround LeBron more shooting, which is why they picked up Reggie Bullock, and why they tried to get Mike Muscala. But it's like, dude, you're not even playing him. Yeah, it's very strange. Yeah, I don't like that deal at all. I think that definitely hurt the Lakers a lot. But, um, but yeah. So, oh, k- let's get into this college basketball real quick, okay? All right, sure, yeah, run it. Okay, so I, I have a bunch of interesting takes here. Because, obviously, everyone talks about Duke, right? Yeah, totally. And I want to ask Kevin this when he's on the show. Um, what? I- how good is Duke without Zion? It's a good question. You made the point that... The fact that they can't, that they've lost a couple of games without him, like, 
What's up with R.J. Barrett and Cam Reddish's gonna, draft stock? How are you going to give these guys the keys to your franchise? How are you going to – I mean, R.J. Barrett is what? The mock draft number three, number four player in the draft? Something like that. And Cam Reddish is right around so there, like too. So, like, what? You, you give these guys to what? The Bulls? You're supposed to – the Bulls need a franchise player. Yeah, it's like you can't even win against NCAA players with other top three draft picks on your team. And you can't do You're that. You're not going to have other top three draft picks on your no. team. No. Yeah, exactly. What if he goes to Orlando? What, I mean, what – you're going to take over the team by your – you can't even beat Virginia Tech. It's sort of like what Giannis is doing with these players on his team. It's like, how good are these guys – how much of this is Zion? That's exactly what I'm trying to say. You know what I'm say. saying? What if Zion went to, like, NC State? And it's Cam Reddish and, and, and Barrett. How many games on their are they own? Win? Are they going to the Final Four? No. Uh, we don't know that. No. RJ Barrett gets triple doubles, but like, how much of that is Zion? Yeah, exactly. When you're the when you're being defended by their second best defender rather than their first best, every team out there, you're getting their second or third best defender. Well, since Zion has gone down, RJ Barrett has not. Yeah. Best what happens player. when what happens when RJ Barrett goes to? Orlando or the Bulls, and then Clay's on him because he's like Clay's like, oh, I'm taking their best guy. What's up, Barrett? Dude, you're not drawing the other team's best defender when Zion's out there. You're getting their second, third best defender. Of course, you can put up numbers. That's on them. exactly what I'm it's trying an to interesting say. Interesting point. And it's Reddish an too. Point. And Reddish too. I mean, Reddish is out here going six of twenty-one. You know, throwing a bricks. I mean, he's can Reddish create his own shot? I haven't seen anything where Reddish can just create his own shot. All these guys are very underwhelming to me. I'm very, very, very underwhelmed by Duke. Yeah, but you're also a UNC fan, no, so it's I'm, clouding I'm, I'm your judgment. T- no, I, Luke May went for like 35 <laughs> against Duke, and then the next night he scored four. So No, I I'm I want to talk because I'm literally thinking about this as a basketball mind, as an NBA mind, because I want R.J. Barrett on the Bulls. I want Cam Reddish on the Bulls. But now that I'm watching these guys, I'm – no, no, I don't. Well, who do you – if they're there, if the well, Bulls get like the fifth pick and they're there, you're not going to take someone else over them. Right. All right. But I'm not – okay, I, that was very misunderstood. Obviously, I want R.J. Barrett and obviously I don't want Cam Reddish. But I'm just saying I'm very concerned about the fact that R.J. Barrett and Cam Reddish cannot go in and win games on their own when NBA teams are looking to hand the keys to their franchise over to these guys to be their franchise centerpiece. It's not even on their own. It's with other NBA caliber players on their team. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, remember Trey Young? Trey Young's eating quadruple team. That's what I was yeah, saying. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's why yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. I'm not worried that Trey Young would ever not produce in the NBA. I just thought he was going to be awesome, right? RJ Barrett and Cam Reddish are not doing anything near what Trey Young was able to do. And well, he, Trey, Young was doing, Trey Young was doing that with, with scrubs. Mm-hmm. None of those guys made it to the league. Yep. You're right. You're right about that. And all of a sudden, he's got John Collins yeah, and like awesome and, players. Yeah, Kevin Herter hits threes. I mean, they they are ter- – Terry and Prince is nice, but they, they just have NBA Dude, Trey Young, players. back-to-back 36-point games, yeah, huh? Yeah, Trey Young is awesome. I yeah. knew that John as Collins, soon as the 34. draft was coming up. Yeah. John Collins and Trey Young are nice, dude. Yeah. That's a nice little pair Go right there. Go get a superstar now. Go I get mean, a they're superstar. they're not going to be able – they have to work through the draft. Yeah. But regardless, your point remains, dude. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I, I agree with you. It's like how – should here's the question. Here's what you're really asking. Should this Zion injury affect Cam and RJ's draft stock? Yes. It a hundred percent should. That's a that's a hot take, but I, I'm not mad at it at all. I totally, you make a great point. Because that's what I'm saying, dude, is none of these guys are stepping up and taking games over and, and doing what they're supposed to do. I mean, I know you were saying, hey, you know, Zion got hurt and they got blown off the floor by UNC, but Play this game again. Run this game back. Without Zion, you know you don't have Zion. Run it back. See, there's there's what my point was, was that how much of the result of that game was due to the shock of losing Zion? If That's, they knew yeah. they weren't going to have him going in, could they have made it a better no. game? I think they could have. I think they did. Uh, oh, a better game? Yeah. Or could they have won? I no. think so. I, I, I don't think they could have won. Dude, Luke they May goes for 36 team. points. I don't think he's doing that if... If they have a way to game plan for him, all of a sudden you throw Zion's backup out there and you're like, hey, go stop that kid. I think it, uh, my counter to that point is Zion got hurt in the first 30 seconds of the game. You have 19 minutes and 30 seconds to game plan around that. Yeah, you have 19 minutes, but if they no, knew you, he was— and you have another half. You have half time, too, to say, hey, Zion's out. But if they knew he's out, you have five full days to game plan around it. You know what I'm saying? 
You have all week to, to talk about what to do. And I to, see no excuse. Reddish and, Reddish dude, and their Bear- entire team is built around Zion. I agree. That's fine. To build your entire team around someone is fine as long as that guy's there. When he's not there, you got the LeBron syndrome of, oh, my God, what do we do? Yeah, but those guys aren't scrubs. Yeah, it's this not about being scrubs. And- it's about, like, it's about not. They, they're they not used to it anymore. They're not used to I, I bet you, that's why I say, like, if you run that back, they'd either win or have a better shot of winning. They have more NBA talent on their team than UNC does on theirs. But this, is, this goes back to my point that Reddish and Barrett are not stepping up to that number three, number four caliber potential draft pick. Yeah, I get what you're saying. It's easy to look good in the three slot. Of a team. Right. It's hard when you get moved up to two and the second guy gets moved up to one. It's like, all right, now go produce like a number one guy. It's tough, dude. It's tough. But I think I think that I agree with you with their draft stock being hurt. I think that Zion getting hurt is the worst thing that could have ever happened to RJ and Cam. I agree. You know what I mean? I think Zion has very, very much so hidden the weaknesses of Barrett and Reddish. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's what LeBron does. It's what Giannis does to people. That's why people like Clay are always like, oh, what's up with those guys? Because it's like, it's so easy to play when you have an all-world talent as your number one guy. It's easy when you're a number one quality guy, but you don't have to play the number one. It's like the D-Wade thing or the Kyrie thing. It's like, dude, I just have to go out here and hoop because he's going to do all the the hard stuff. He's going to draw all the doubles. He's going to draw their best defenders. And he's still got to produce like a number one guy. I just got to go out there and hoop at this point. You know what I mean? And then when you get moved in that number one role, it's tough, man. It's tough. My whole thing about this, though, is it always comes back to Reddish and Barrett are the number two and number three high school recruits in the country. These guys, all their whole life, all they've done is ball out. They've always been the number one guy. That's true. They've always just gotten buckets. That's true. They're the only reason they went to Duke because they were number two, number three guys. Right? In the, I mean, the high school class, right? So Zion, I, my, my whole thing with Zion, why he went to Duke is, hey, I have Barrett and Reddish here. I'm going to go get buckets with them. It'll be fun. Right? Is there tampering in college? No, I don't know. No, about no, no, that. no. I'm saying if you, all the top high school recruits know each other, right? They go to the same Nike camps and right. stuff like that. What if you're just like, hey, guys, come here. We're one through five. Let's all go meet up at UNC, or let's all go meet up at Duke. Yeah, that's that's probably you think it happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah for definitely, sure. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. But I, I just think. I don't know, dude. I, I'm very, very upset at Duke right now. And it, it's not even because I'm a UNC guy. It's, it's be, I'm looking at it as I want the NBA to get better. I'm always looking at top guys to make the NBA better. And Reddish and Bear aren't doing that. They, they just aren't doing that. They aren't stepping up to their number three, number four dra- potential draft pick potential. They just aren't. And it's, it's very it's – very, Almost like disheartening because everyone talks about. You remember in the beginning of the year, before we even heard about John Morant, it was oh Zion's one, Barrett's two, two Reddish is three. three. Yeah, for sure, definitely. And now it's now they're dropping. Yeah, and dropping. So on dropping. some draft boards, on some mock draft boards, Reddish is nine. He's like there at nine. That's what I'm trying. He to could say. go to the Lakers, dude. The Lakers have a better shot. Did you hear this? The Lakers have a better shot of getting the number one pick yeah. than they do. They have like a 2% chance of making the and playoffs. Six 6%. percent chance of. So people are like, sit LeBron, tank yeah, tank for, for Zion. Zion. Yeah, that's yeah. hilarious. <laughs> that's so funny. How about what well, you told me yesterday? The Warriors lost two straight, and all the Warriors pages online are like, tank for Zion. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's so stupid. Uh, that's so funny. Yeah. Um, I don't know, man. I just, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm tired of this whole Barrett Reddish thing. I'm over it. I'm over it. I'm gonna hold you to it. You keep that same energy next year when they're tearing it up. Well, no, I'm not going to because I'm I'm basing my opinion off of what they're doing right now. And you're gonna tell me that Reddish and Barrett are the number two and number three high school recruits. Actually, RJ Barrett was the number one player in the country coming out of high school. Zion was two. That's absurd. <laughs> Even though they play well together. Barrett was like on the all Canada team. He was I mean, he played in the in the Olympics or something. I mean I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey man, you have and, a solid point. And they can't go out and beat Virginia Tech? Yeah, that's fair. Stop it. That's fair. That's fair. That's definitely fair. Oh wow. Moving on. Um uh, last thing I want to talk about for college basketball, we'll take a break, okay? All right. Um How about this one and done rule. Yeah, let's get into okay. this. Okay, so 
I woke up this morning and ESPN Classic is running throwbacks on NBA players now and how they were in college mm-hmm. and stuff. So I was watching Kawhi Leonard, mm-hmm. right? Kawhi Leonard played San what? San Diego State. Played what? Three years at San Diego State, mm-hmm. right? Does college basketball get worse with the one and done rule gone? No, of course not. I agree. Of course not. In fact, I make the I can make the other argument that these one and done guys, your Zions and stuff, you're just taking roster spots from. Other guys. Yeah. But they're can... getting scholarships elsewhere. What do you mean? I mean, how many sc- Division One schools are there in the country? Oh, okay. So you're saying Zion takes your spot. You're just going to go to yeah. somewhere else. Right. That's fair. But it's like my point is if you have guys who are going to stay longer, you're going to have more guys who are like four-year guys. Well, this is what UNC and does. And that will progress the players, which will progress college basketball. This is what in, UNC does every year. They they get four-year guys. They have not fallen to the one-and-done um the one and done curse, if you will. I mean, Duke is falling under it. Kentucky is falling under it. Yeah. All these other teams are falling under it. UNC has not done that. They're getting four year players who progress. They get better every year. And then tournament time, when all these guys are seniors, they all have. I mean, UNC went to back to back national championship games. Yeah. So those four year seniors, those guys who've been through that all, you're going to tell me they're not going to have tournament experience against these one and done freshmen like Cat and Booker? Who are just here, hey, let me get one one game in the tournament and I'll be a number one pick. Like DeAndre Ayton, you remember how bad yeah, that was? Yeah, it was terrible. It was bad. DeAndre Ayton was the worst thing to happen in college basketball. So what are you proposing that they just – well, they're going to. They're going yeah, to eliminate the one Yeah, I think you need, to, you need to eliminate the one and done. But I also think that there are families out there that are going to tell their kids, hey, you need to get a degree. Like, go get a degree. Who? And those – those those top basketball players, some of their parents are going to say, hey, go get a degree. Not all these top guys. I don't are- know, man. After the Zion injury, people are literally saying the opposite. What am I going to get a degree for? To get a degree and get a job where I start at fifty grand, Or I could just no, go no, straight no. to the league and make seven figures well, right off the right. bat. Zion is such an exaggerated example because Zion, nobody is like Zion. And I think if— Fine, and- a regular first-round pick, even a second-round pick. But we don't—why th- would why would you risk that? You can Why always would you, come back to school if you don't get drafted. Yeah, but if you declare— You don't forego your amateur status. But if you declare for the draft and sign an agent, you can't go back to school. Is that true? Yes. I thought it was if you accept no. a dollar for no. your play. No, if you sign an agent, you're done. See, that rule needs to change. So there's so many rules that need to change around this because then that rule needs to change. Because that's not fair because you're still technically an amateur because you haven't accepted money for your— games yet how about the Lamelo ball rule where the ball family changed it and like you know flipped it around and because Lamelo didn't accept a dollar his dad did that he's eligible to play basketball that's how he's still yeah. playing as an amateur yeah. i wondered that because like you go to lithuania you're playing as a pro you're getting money yeah but his dad's getting it not him which i mean i'm sure i mean he's out here driving ferraris so i mean i'm <laughs> sure he's taking the money he's out here driving ferraris yeah, I, I mean he's in high school <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they're also like famous. They have like a Facebook show. Like they are. So, see, that's another weird thing about this. It's like about playing, paying these college players. It's like I sort of get. Even the Levar Ball pisses me off. I sort of get where he's coming from. He's like, no, I'm. I have a famous family. I'm not bringing my son to your school to put butts in seats and you up those ticket prices and I make your school so much money and you don't. You're literally exploiting my name. And you're making us work for free. I, even though LeVar Ball bothers me sometimes, I sort of get where he's coming from. Where he's like, no, I'll go play overseas. That's what Luca said, remember? Luca was like, dude, go play. If you don't want to play in college and have these schools. These go schools have check. their money. Go get a check. Make your money, dude. Yeah, these schools have theirs. Yeah. Go make your money. You know what I mean? I, I sort of get that. It's it's a tough. It's like a tricky situation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man. I, it's tough. It's very tough. And college basketball is so whack. And we got into a really good uh, segment last last week on, on the paying NCAA college players and, and how Zion. bogus it is. Yeah, yeah. But if anyone's listening, go to our SoundCloud Step Back podcast and go listen to uh, I think it's episode eight, whatever the last one was. Um, we did an awesome segment on paying college players. We really broke it down in the NCAA and how it's corrupt, just like the Olympics. It's yeah, it's weird, man. They own the rights and likeness of these kids. They put their pictures everywhere, and they. They sell, yeah. you know, the reason those tickets were so expensive to that Duke-UNC game was to see Zion. You right. know what I mean? Exactly. He's, he's wearing Paul George's because Duke has a five or a $15 million Nike deal, 
So he, why can't he create his? Why can't he accept his own endorsement deal for shoes and pick his own shoes he because wants? Because college to athletes can't. It's get annoying, paid. Yeah. dude. Yeah. It's, it's annoying. So horrible. Yeah. Zion, I'm sure Zion, because you made a really good point about basketball shoes, and they're made for the, the player. player, right? So yeah. why is Zion in PGs? Why is he not in yeah. LeBron? He's out there wearing a, yeah. a shoe that's designed for a 208 pound silky smooth two way <laughs> wing. Like, dude, just suck it up and go wear those clunky LeBrons. See, they're made for people like you. You don't get injured. You play the totally. whole year. Yeah. That's why like, people always argue about, like, like just regular people, not basketball players. They're like, oh, Jordans are so much better than LeBrons in terms of shoes. It's like, yeah, Jordan's 6'6", 210. LeBron is 6'9", 280. You know what? They're, ma- they're created differently. These players are wearing those shoes. Like, of course, Jordans. Are, yeah. People yes. are like, yeah, you could wear, I'm wearing Jordans right now. Jordans 4, Retro 4, White Cements. People are like, yeah, so are you. You're wearing Jordan Retro 1s. Yeah. These people are like, yeah, you can't wear wear LeBron shoes with jeans. It's like, yeah, he's 6'9", 280, dude. They're like a clunk around in those all Yeah, day? It's, they're like a soldier's boot who's ready to go for war, ready to go to war. Where it's like... They're ready to attack. Paul George, Kyrie, even Jordan. Like, you could wear these guys' shoes. They're smaller. They're made for little finesse players. Yeah. In that same... Regard why is somebody like Zion, who's just an absolute tank and so explosive and massive, why is he playing in Paul George? Of course he exploded out of his shoe. <laughs> what? Is that su- does that surprise anybody? He shouldn't be wearing those to begin with. Oh, it's so God. ridiculous. Everyone's like, "Oh my God, Zion blew out of his shoe." You're like, "Yeah, it makes sense." Yes. He's wearing Paul George's. Right. You ever see Paul George? He glides around the yeah. court. He's not like exploding. It's a, it's a different thing. Yeah. yeah. I uh, here I, I have a one quick take for you, real quick, because I saw this. This is totally off topic. Okay. Kobe and LeBron. Okay. Switch him. Does Kobe take this team to the playoffs? Which Kobe? Uh, any Kobe. Pick a Kobe. But there's different Kobe's. Uh, Kobe in his prime. LeBron in his prime. So you mean like Kobe and Paul? That Kobe? Cause like oh one Kobe is not his prime. No. He got carried a little bit and by like Shaq. Like twenty fifteen Kobe sucks too. Yeah, there's like a middle ground there. <laughs> yeah, like the like the fourth and fifth ring are prime like Kobe. Oh six oh seven. Yeah, yeah, Kobe that's prime legit. Kobe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know, man. I don't know. Wait, you said does he take him to the playoffs? Yeah, and I think LeBron takes him to the playoffs too. So you think LeBron? We didn't even talk about LeBron's game winner to the other night. <laughs> no he one. had a crazy and one. Which put him up three. He had the defensive stop where he one on one Drew Holiday How picked about, his pocket, came down the other side, hit the game winner <laughs> off of one foot, falling out of bounds for to game. ice the th- yeah from the corner. Like, come on, man. How about him talking all that all that talk to James Harden about what's up? Oh, dude. How yeah. about when when they, he got asked like, "Yo, people think you're a defensive liability, and uh, they're gonna single you out," and LeBron just goes. Come on with it. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, bring what's it. up then? <laughs> yeah, bring yeah, that it. Was awesome. <laughs> yeah, I that love was awesome. LeBron. How about the day before LeBron had that performance? Stephen A. Smith was like, he's old. He's not yeah. the best player anymore. LeBron like LeBron's always like posting like trolling things on his Instagram where he's just like, life is great. And yeah. He's like smiling and stuff. Yeah, how about the picture of him walking through the tunnel and goes, life is great. He's yeah. smiling. He's wearing he's like $20,000. Glasses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's got like an unbelievable chain that's worth yeah. more than my car. <laughs> my life, life is cool. Yeah, of co- I bet it is, dude. Not debating that. Yeah, at all. But I just loved when, uh, I think it was, was it Mannix? Somebody from ESPN was, or Fox Sports 1 was like, Hey, every team thinks you're a defensive liability. You don't play defense. Like, what do you have? What's your comment to that? He's like, come on with it. Yeah, bring it. Yeah, who you got? Send him my way. It's true. He doesn't really play. His man to man defense when he tries to lock up one guy is still good. It's his help defense. He doesn't rotate at all. No. Like, whenever anyone winds up with an open shot and it's his rotation, he just kind of looks at him and turns around and waits for yeah. the rebound. <laughs> he just sort of camps in the lane. He's like, ah, whatever. that's too many steps. I'm not right. running out there. Again. Right, exactly. But I, I, I agree with you. I think if if someone, if LeBron really had to get a stop, like in the finals, he just sends you good out shot off the glass. Uh, dude, remember the Tiago splitter one? Yeah, in- incredible. Tiago splitter is like three That was steps a long of- time ago. He was on the heat, but still. Tiago yeah. splitter's coming full speed, and that was not LeBron's man. He rotated into the lane. He was at a dead stop. He spent down and jumped off two feet. And just sends it. Yeah, get, a, get that crap yeah. way out of here, dude. Get it all the way, way out of here. Never yeah. again. Yeah, don't even try that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, dude, and I think that's the other thing is I think in the playoffs, he'll step it up even more. Like he says, oh, playoff mode activated. No, it isn't. 
No, nah, it isn't. No way. I thought that Pelicans gave him a sub playoff, LeBron. Uh, he was still kind of inefficient. What was his? How many? What did he shoot? No, it doesn't matter. I think LeBron just took the game over. Definitely, at yeah. the end of the game, he yeah. takes the game over. Yeah, right. for sure. Which is another reason why I think that he paces himself throughout the course of the game, throughout the course of the season, especially defensively. He's like, listen, all these other guys don't get the heat. They don't get yelled at. They don't get roasted by the media when it's a close game and we lose. I do because my job is to take that game over right there. So he kind of like paces himself and rests because he's I think like, LeBron, well, there's four minutes left. That falls on me. If it's a close, if it's a four point game of four minutes left, yeah. nobody else gets blamed when we lose that. It's my fault because it's my responsibility to take that thing over and bring it home. I think LeBron is one of the best in NBA history at just knowing when to turn it on and knowing how to pace himself. He's gotten so good at picking his spots. Yeah. He can dude, sometimes with like two minutes left in the in the half or something, he'll just get like nine straight points. Cause he's just like, all right, I've I got seven assists. It's almost halftime. I got guys involved. I got guys that shot. Guys are in a rhythm. Give me the ball for the next minute and forty nine seconds. I'm just gonna get bucket. And he'll yeah. get like eleven points real yeah. quick. And then they go to halftime. He does that a lot. He's gotten so good at picking his spots as as his career has gone on. Because like early on, he was so hyped all the time and he was just trying so hard. It was so exhausting. Whereas now he kind of hangs around and he just sort of picks his spots of when to yeah. attack and when to get his other he's guys so involved. He's so good at that. Yeah, yeah. He's really good at that. His awareness. Well, even Skip Bayless, who's the biggest LeBron hater in the world, always says he might have the greatest basketball IQ ever. of anyone ever. ever. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, agree with for that sure. statement. Yeah. You ready to go on break? Yeah, let's take a little break. Um, we'll be back with Kevin Harlan. Yeah, huh? when we come back, we got a special guest. Uh, that'll be right around the top of the hour, maybe a couple minutes after. So stay tuned right here. 88.1 WLRA with a step back with uh, Kyle and Pat. And uh, cool, yeah, we'll be back. Stay tuned. Thanks for staying tuned to 88.1 WLRA for the step back. Next up, we have a very special guest, the voice of NBA on TNT, 2K Sports, and the 2017 National Sportscaster of the Year, Kevin Harlan. How's it going, Kevin? Can you hear me okay? I can, yeah. Thanks for having me on. Good to be on with you this afternoon. Oh, my God. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. It's an absolute honor to have you on the step back. Total honor. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Well, you're nice to say that. I'm I'm honored to be on with you guys and uh, hearing those highlights. Um, just uh, brought back some wonderful basketball that I've had a, the honor of calling over the last couple decades, and uh, brings back very good memories. That's awesome. Yeah, you're <laughs> so cool. Yeah, you're the you're pretty much the voice of our entire you know our entire lives. We we are hoping to get into something along the lines of what you do. We're aspiring sports broadcasters. We do a sports show. Um, so I got to ask you, how did you get your start um, doing what it is that you do? Well, I went to a uh, high school in Green Bay, Wisconsin, that had at the time a 10-watt uh, over-the-air radio station run by the high school students and managed by the faculty at uh, at this school in Green Bay. And uh, I had a chance to uh, get involved when I was a freshman and uh, tried out for the play-by-play job when I was 14 for football and was uh, was lucky enough to, uh, to win the little contest they had, a little audition with about 25 other students. And uh, from that point on, I just I kind of caught the bug. Uh, my dad was a journalism major at Marquette. So he knew a lot about uh, the business, and um, uh, he was a great early teacher in trying to, you know, as I was laying a foundation for 
uh, some of the things uh, that make a good reporter um, and uh, some uh, hints and ideas about becoming a good writer. And uh, all that served as a wonderful backdrop uh, for, um, uh, for a start in the business, which I've enjoyed ever since. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And uh, I, I want to ask you my next question is because uh, we go to Lewis, you know, we're, we're kind of in a small school here in Romeoville, Illinois. And um, I just I, I think my opinion for broadcasting is it's kind of hard nowadays if you don't go to a big school such as Syracuse or, you know, all these other top broadcasting schools. So I guess our question is, does it hinder us in any way that we go to this little school? No, not at all. I, I think the only thing that would be different is that there would be like uh, 200 of guys like you. <laughs> you know, there'd be, yeah, right. You, you'd, you'd have uh, multiple kids, men and women, that would be looking to get in the business, and the competition would be, you know, severe. Um, but you can still get the experience and still hone your craft, regardless of the size of the school. It's just how much you want to put into it. I mean, there will always be someone that goes to a bigger school, a more reputable school, uh, that will drive a bigger car, have a bigger house, you know, be, you know, have more money, have uh, more degrees. But the only thing that you really should concentrate on is how can you be the best version of yourself? And that means, you know, self-appraisal and constantly uh, checking your work uh, getting as many reps as you possibly can on the air. You know, that, that saying uh, from uh, Malcolm Gladwell that uh, you, you perfect something with 10,000 hours uh, of doing it. And, and that is a lot of what broadcasting is, uh, like in any, anything. Uh, it's, it's the more you work at it, the more you try to get better at it, um, uh, and the more you enjoy it, uh, all these things will just kind of connect, and and you'll find yourself hopefully uh, where you think you'd like to be. You know, five, ten, fifteen years down the road. I mean, I I came from a small school uh, in Green Bay, and uh, went to a pretty good journalism school at the University of Kansas, but it wasn't as good as Syracuse or the Medell School at Northwestern or uh, University of Georgia or USC or some of these other great – Missouri, these other great journalism schools, but it was a good school. But what I tried to do is is not just rely on the coursework that I took and the things that the school offered. I did all that. But I tried to manufacture things outside of the school and the commercial area. So when I was a freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior in college – I was constantly working for commercial radio stations, uh, whether they be in Lawrence, Kansas, or in Topeka, or in Kansas City, and and I just had this, uh, luckily, this great appetite for work. And I didn't care if I was getting paid; I was you know, my my pay was getting experience. Right. So I lo- I loved. Uh, we've got a daughter who's in broadcasting. She's with ESPN. She got out of the University of Georgia about four years ago. And I told her, I said, I'll know if, if you're, you know, cut out for this business by how much time you put into it um, while you're still in school. Because there's so many things that kind of, you know, pull you in, in 18 different directions in school, your social life, your studies, uh, your friends, I mean, just everything. And, and uh, sometimes some of those things have got to go you know second and third behind your priority of getting experience covering a game writing a story editing tape whatever it might be and she did that and and i felt that i did that in college so i always felt like you know i don't care where i start i love the business so much and enjoy the process of getting better so much that i i don't care where i start or how much money i make because i knew that that eventually um, and most importantly, that I would always enjoy my work. And, and that was that was the thing that I imparted on her. And I think she has shown that. And it's certainly something that has guided me in my career. Yeah, that makes total sense. And when it when it comes to because, um, you know, you have such legendary calls and such, you know, calls that are all over highlight reels everywhere and they'll live on forever. I got to ask you, like, how did you get to that point? Do you think? 
of your phrases and your calls beforehand, or do they sort of come natural during the flow of the game? No, I, there's nothing prepared. It just kind of comes in the flow yeah. of the game. I mean, yeah. Each each of those little highlights that you played were all all off the cuff and organic uh, to the moment. And, That's so and awesome. you know, I, I, I always think that um, first and foremost that I'm a fan. And um, I bet fans in the stands say crazy stuff like that all the time. And when you played pickup basketball, as I did when I was in high school and college and intramural sports and things like that, you know, guys are talking trash on the floor and, you know, giving you the business and, and uh, you know, things, you know, just they just things kind of pop up and they, and they kind of remain in the, you know, the deep, dark recesses of your mind, and you never know what is going to really happen. But the, 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 the key, I think, in anything like that, and like I said, all of those have been organic calls that just kind of happen with a natural reaction, is that, you know, one, one of the things I think which is real important, especially with play-by-play, is to kind of lose yourself in the game. Uh, in other words, you're not distracted by uh, halftime entertainment. You're not distracted by... Um, uh, people walking around or noises in the building or whatever, whatever, whatever it may be. You're so focused and so into the game that you really don't even think you're, you know, broadcasting. You're just like, you're, you're so immersed and you, you just lose yourself in the game. And when you do that, all those things kind of come naturally. They just kind of come out. So that's really what happened in all those games. Like, like I'm always so surprised When I watch back a game and I'm grading my work and I hear all this music and the thumping of drums and all this noise, I go, God almighty, I cannot believe all the, all the external noise that's going on in games, you know, through the loudspeaker and the PA guy yelling. Because I'm telling you, if you, if you're really focused and embedded in a game, you lose yourself in the game and the broadcast like you never even notice that stuff. So I'm sure right. I'd go back and watch the most recent game I did, which was uh, I did a Florida State North Carolina game last week for CBS, and I noticed it then. But um, I did a Denver Utah NBA game, and and I'm sure if I went back and heard all the music they played, while each possession and all the you know electronic noises and lights and all this stuff going on, that I go I didn't even notice that stuff. And right. and it's it's yeah. so true. I don't I don't notice any of it. So it's weird when I watch back and hear it again. So when it comes to these, I got to ask, when it comes to these legendary calls that you've had that will live on forever, do people ever like shout those to you when they see you around? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes they will, you know, uh, it, 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 people like, like I, I'm not, I don't get noticed that much, which is great. And, and don't expect to and don't even think about it really but people ask that question all the time they notice you're on planes and no they don't and sometimes when i talk like if i talk to a ticket agent or if i'm asking a question or if i'm uh you know riding in a cab or something like that the guy go wait a minute i think i know that voice from someplace and um you know whether it's the fanatics commercial or the uh or the video game or the you know the different things i'm lucky enough to do it's probably I'm recognized by voice, but if I don't open my mouth, I'm just like any regular guy walking down the street. And I'm, and and, um, and and then sometimes, like, if people do yell out one of those calls, it's at a game and it's after the game. When I've taken off my headset and I'm packing my briefcase and I'm getting ready to sit up from the chair behind the desk, um, uh, they'll, 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 you know, yell from behind, hey, can we get a picture or whatever, and and as they walk over there, they'll say, oh, right on, Cowboy. Oh, right, that's a yeah, great that's one. Awesome. That's a legendary call. <laughs> so they'll, they'll say that, and I start laughing. And then invariably, you know, it's like 13, 14, 15-year-old kids. And then I look in back of them, and there's mom and dad up there, and they're laughing because they're going, oh, my God, here's this guy who I hear this this ridiculous video game my kid plays, you know, all the time in the, in the basement. And I hear his voice all the time. So oh, that that's what that guy looks like. That's who he is. Yeah. So, you know, it's a little bit of like, uh-oh. <laughs> right. uh, but, but I, it, it's, it's fun. And, and that's kind of why you're in the business. I mean, you wouldn't be in the business if, if you didn't, you know, enjoy the things around it. And that's dealing with people. So I, I do enjoy dealing with people. When someone says that it's, 
I always take it as a as a hello in, in their way, and I'm always I always try to be as kind as I can. And I appreciate them, you know, even even wanting to get a picture or whatever, say hello. Yeah, that's awesome. So because you're a big NBA guy, I do want to talk a little basketball, if that's okay with you. Um, sure. Yeah. So I'm sure you've heard about this Zion Williamson that is everybody, you know, blowing up over, right? Um, I I can't help but think without Zion and maybe I'm wrong here so tell me if I'm wrong but my opinion is with Zion Williamson out I think you know these guys are RJ Barrett and Cam Reddish they should be stepping up for for these guys being ranked three and four in the mock draft do you think without Zion it's hindering their ability to be a top five pick because they're not performing as well without Zion well, that's a good question. I, I think he casts a pretty long shadow, and I think that when you play with a player like that, like if you play with LeBron or Kobe or Michael or whoever, right. I think you're, you, you sometimes find yourself kind of standing and watching. But at the same time, you know, the kids you just mentioned, Barrett Reddish and, and Williamson, they were the top three recruits right. in the country. Right, that's what so I'm like, saying. Like, and they've all got – egos and they've all got you know that bravado that made them that good along with their god-given skills so um i would think you know when you wear that jersey and that name duke is across the front of the jersey that you're not only representing you know what your current team is but you're representing christian leitner and grant hill and, and all the wonderful players that have played in that program before you and i don't necessarily think that they are shying uh, away from the spotlight or not performing up to task, I think it's just a lot easier for opposing teams to defend two guys as opposed to defending three good guys. Right. Totally. Yeah. That's what and, I was and, saying, and, too. And, yeah, and that little guard is pretty good, too. He was he was like a top 20 player in the country as well out of yeah. Minneapolis, that little guard they've got. So, so that, I mean, that's a hell of a team that they've, they've recruited, and and I saw somebody, I think it was Mike Greenberg at ESPN said, uh, it reminds him of the Fab Five at Michigan with Chris Weber and, um, and Jalen Rose and King and all those kids that played for Steve Fisher in the Fab Five for the Michigan Wolverines in the early 90s. Like, these guys are like, I mean, this is the best group of freshmen that a team has had maybe since then. So, and Williamson is certainly at the very beginning of that sentence you know because he means so much but when you've got three guys to defend uh it can be pretty difficult and daunting for a defense but if you're down to two guys to defend now you know now you can begin to double more and 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 they play with a little bit more confidence and swagger but listen barrett and reddish are two very good players and they're they're going to be selected very high if, if not right back of Williamson should they all decide to go pro and I, I think uh, the way they were ranked as high schoolers will be the way they're drafted in May in the NBA or in June in the NBA yeah that's what I think absolutely too. so I got a question speaking of Zion what what type of player do you think he can be at the next level like are we talking a franchise changing MVP caliber player or what do you see out of him well it's interesting you know he's kind of a between size player like he's not like what we're get, beginning to see with um, long, lanky fours in the NBA that are shooting threes and, 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 and that kind of a player. Um, he's maybe too big to be a three, but that would be a great matchup for him in the NBA. Um, he's obviously gifted. He's got terrific feet. His footwork is, is so far advanced. Um, he has a great feel for what his body can do. Even with him gaining all this weight, they keep talking about over the last year and a half or whatever, where he's gained over a hundred pounds or some ridiculous number like that. I've heard. I don't think the NBA is going to want him that heavy. I think the NBA is going to want him a little bit slimmer. And um, uh, if he can stay healthy, and you know he's kind of built that way, he's not built in a frail, lengthy way. He's he's a he's a, a kind of a Larry Johnson type of build to him. Um, you know, Larry Johnson was good. He was an all-star, but he, he was injured. And he was kind of in a position that you really don't necessarily think of as a guy who can be that, that player. See, LeBron is 6'8". He's all of 6'8", and he is 270. So he's got the girth of Williamson, 
but he's got some size on him too. He's got more length. Yeah. And that's what makes him so different. Michael and Kobe were like in that six 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 five realm. So they were wings. They could handle the ball. They could play guard as easily as they could move maybe up in the front court. And so they were kind of locked in at that position. That made them unique. But when you're like six 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 seven, like this kid is, and with that kind of weight and, and body mass, um, he's going to be an interesting uh, fit. Now, listen. He's going to be a tremendous pro. But would he be a LeBron-like pro? Would he be like Kobe or Michael? Right. I, I'm not sure if his body, you know, lends itself to that. Then again, when LeBron came in at 6'8", people weren't really sure, could he play, could, he could play point, but should he play point? Should he play uh, four? Like, like, where will he play? And he's played every position. We've seen him play five and one. So, He's played all those positions. I'll, I'll have to see if if Williams ha, Williamson's handle is as good as LeBron. If his playmaking ability is that good, is that unselfish attitude like LeBron has? Is it that good? But he's two inches shorter than LeBron, and I think that's something to kind of keep an eye on. And, and as you begin to judge his kid, he's only nineteen, so we're really stepping out on a limb here, trying to figure out what he's going to be. He's not even what he's going to be at Duke let alone what he's going to be in the NBA. So he's let's let's be patient with his development and watch and enjoy him as he takes each step. Yeah, I agree. Uh, last question here for you, Kevin. We'll let you get back to your busy schedule. But uh, as we ask everybody on this show, uh, in your opinion, who's the greatest of all time? Well, um, um, I, I think it's pretty hard to disregard Michael um, because – Michael still played in an era where the offense wasn't stressed the way it is now. He played in a grinded-out, defensive-oriented game, and it was much more physical. If Jordan played now with these offensive rules, I mean, he would be unbelievable. Plus, his will and his drive and his, you know, what he did and how he made everybody around him better was, was really something to behold. And so, um, and I called him from his rookie year through his last year. And Kobe is, is as wired as Michael was. And Kobe may not have been as big. He got bigger as he played. Mm-hmm. But, but he, you know, obviously uh, did some incredible things with the Lakers in five championships. And then LeBron, um, you know, and I'm talking modern players. I'm not going back to Oscar Robertson and Bill Chamberlain, who on their own, and Bill Russell, who on their own, you know, uh, platform were as dominant as these three guys I'm talking about now. But these are the guys I've seen, so I'm I'm, I'm more adept at comment on them. But 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 LeBron's numbers are going to be past Michael's. They're going to be past Kobe's. Um, he may not win as many championships as those two guys. But he's been in the finals all these years, which is an incredible accomplishment. And he's never really had the great players, I think, that Kobe and Michael have always had around him. Totally. Kobe's had the best players around him. Definitely. Michael I had agree more. maybe, a, yeah, just a little bit below. And then LeBron has really never had the benefit of having other Hall of Famers around him. And I think that uh, so, so it, it, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to grade these guys and who is the greatest. But Michael is. Michael was unbelievable, and um, and I, I guess he would probably be number one in my book. Definitely. Well, awesome. That's an, just an awesome answer. Uh, we kind of sort of debate that with everyone here on this show since it's such a such a polarizing question. But listen, thanks so much for coming on. It was an absolute honor. Uh, we totally look up to you. We've you've been the voice of our entire lives up to this point. So we can't thank you enough. Um, yeah, we just really appreciate for com- you for coming on. And uh, we're going to go to a little break here, and we'll send Kevin on his way. Thank you guys for listening. This is The Step Back, 88.1 WLRA. All right, and we're back in The Step Back. What'd wow. You, what did you think about that, Pat? That was unreal. We just had Kevin. Dude, as soon as he started talking, yeah. that was Kevin Harlan from 2K and from yeah. NBA and TNT. Yeah. As soon as I had him on the phone, I kind of was just like, Oh my! I felt like I was 11 years yeah. old. I was like, "Oh, this is Kevin Harlan. Yeah. He does the all the great calls." Yeah, that was an unbelievable interview. I can't thank Kevin Harlan enough. And uh, gosh, what an what an honor to have on our show, and just one of the great great voices in all of sports and football, basketball. Just an unbelievable, 
unbelievable, just iconic figure in, in, in sports broadcasting. So thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, I, we really, really appreciate it. It helps our career, and, you know, it just, you know, it's – like he said, it's the pinnacle of our broadcasting career so far. So um, just an unbelievable, unbelievable honor to have him on. So, um, but yeah, so. And he was so knowledgeable about the game, too. Yeah, I loved yeah. it. I loved it. Yeah. Once we started, because, you know, we started asking him broadcast questions right. and how he got to where he is and the play-by-play stuff. And then we sort of switched gears and started talking about actual NBA questions in college. He knows his he, stuff, for dude, sure. he knows yeah. his stuff. So, I mean, you have to, I guess. Yeah. Like he said, he called Michael's career from the first play to the last yeah. one, like, Come on, man. Like, at that point, he's got – and, he, dude, he even watch his college. He was talking about Zion he and Cam He did the North Carolina-Florida State game, he said. Yeah. Unbelievable. That was just – Awesome. Yeah, that was wild, man. That was incredible. The time just flew by. Yeah, huh? we had him for 25 minutes. It felt like nothing. Yeah, it felt like five seconds. Yeah, totally. Want to call him back? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, we can never call that number again. No. All uh, right, well, that was just uh, – Oh my God! What an honor, huh? Yeah. Like especially for you and I, as like basketball guys. And we do, we go to Lewis. You know that's the coolest thing is we we just go to a small university. And we just had one of the like I said, just a polarizing figure in the broadcasting community, just in the sports broadcasting community, just in the professional sports broadcasting community. Yeah, at just, the highest level. Yeah, that he's you can just get. called in at Lewis. I mean, it's just unbelievable, and I'm just so so honored to have talk to him dude. I but mean, I mean just, yeah wow. sort of but like like he said he went to a small school he got his start in college radio so yeah. it makes sense that he'd want to kind of help out you know that Nick Wright just bought their, their his entire college radio station yeah. I think he went to Syracuse yeah. he bought it yeah. he owns it N- well Nick Wright has a lot of money <laughs> no I know I'm not even saying yeah. that. I'm just saying like once these guys get to these elevated levels they and back. yeah they want because they're like I remember what it was like to sit in those chairs and those studios and do all that. I loved him talking about Malcolm Gladwell's yeah. 10,000 uh, hours. Yeah, that was awesome. You get good at something by 10,000 10, hours. hours. Yeah, said just the more work you put in, the better you get, which, I mean, is great advice. And, wow, that was awesome. Yeah, that was pretty incredible. So what do you think? I mean, I we really talked about everything we had to talk about, so... All right, yeah, you want to uh, want to get out of here? Yeah, 88.1 WLA to start. We're going to post this, and... Hopefully, we're going to try and get some, some more people out. We're going to make some moves here. We're going to start sending some people some DMs and some emails, and we're going to figure out see if we can get another guest on um, by the end of the year. That's our goal. So um, this has been the Step Back. Yeah, you- if you guys want to follow along, follow on our uh, social media pages, Step Back Podcast on Instagram, Step Back Pod on Twitter. Uh, you guys can – um, follow along on SoundCloud. We got a SoundCloud where we post all of these in podcast form afterwards, a YouTube page. So just find us on all the social media, Step Back Podcast. So uh, what do you think? That's it, huh? Yeah, that's, that's everything. All right, man. For Pat Sabolka, I'm Kyle Coleman, and this is a Step Back Podcast. Thanks for listening. We're out. <laughs>